Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of Trucker Money. It is Friday. This will be Trucker Money number 35. We get together every Friday. We talk about something outside of trucking. Uh, money, personal finance, investing, uh, anything to do with money. And uh, passive income, one of my favorites. And, uh, and then trucking six days a week. You need a break from it. So Friday we do this. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is going to be for the week of January 5th, 25th through the 29th. Had a little bit of uh, income come in this week, side income. Not great. January is not a great month, but uh, we get through it back on track. February will be better, and March will be better yet. So every week, I'd like to start off by talking about any moves I made for the week and any passive income or side income I might have received. Uh, first of all, uh, check out the links in the description below. I'm not going to probably continue to promote them things every month, but I earn a little bit of side income off of uh, Mudflap and and YouTube. It's not much. I don't make much, just a small channel. But anyway, check those out. Got some good discounts on fuel and uh, some different additives, anti-gel, stuff like that. I don't promote anything I don't use. And I have videos on all those things. So let's check out the links below. And let's talk about the passive income dividend portfolio. What happened there for the week? Well, we got Two dividend increases for the week. So we got two raises for doing nothing other than being loyal shareholders. First one is Archer Daniels Midland, ticker symbol ADM, raised their dividend 2.78%. And Kimberly Clark, ticker symbol KMB, raised their dividend 6.54%. So that's kind of nice. Raise just for doing nothing. It compounds and builds over time. Uh, really adds to the compounding. So who paid for the week? Only two. Uh, LTC, which is a uh, real estate investment trust that deals in long-term care fa facilities and Cisco, not the computer company, but the food service company, ticker symbol SYY, they paid also. And what did I buy? I only picked up a little bit more Southern Company, Southern Company rather, sorry, utility that's on my list to buy for 2021 and uh, bought a little bit more shares of FDVV, which is a Fidelity uh, high dividend income fund. Uh, talked about maybe for this year, I put a little bit more into the ETFs, mutual funds, things like that. Kind of employing a more of a conservative strategy for 2021. Now, other than that, let's talk about, we hear all these financial terms thrown around all the time, and a lot of them we don't know, you know exactly what they mean. And there's no harm in that. And knowing what some of these things mean can be can be really valuable to you or help to assess an investment or a lot of these can be even used in your trucking business if you desire. And I'll point those a lot out along the way. I only picked a couple here because, I mean, there's so many things we could do this for hours. So I just grabbed a couple out of the blue that I thought might be uh, uh, pertinent or on people's minds. And the first one I want to start it off with, now this one I got a little bit to say about, it's the word asset. What does asset mean? You hear that all the time. I kind of have a different perspective on it. <clears throat> uh, an asset is something like uh, that is expected to go up over time, that has value now or has future value. Now, I like to add in there, an asset gives me income just because that's my strategy. Okay. Now, about assets, Robert Kiyosaki says, and this is really valuable, so so this is worth the price of watching alone. And I hope you spend some time and think about this. Robert Kiyosaki says, rich people are rich because they buy assets. Well, they're also rich because they tend typically have businesses or whatever. I'm not talking about athletes and celebrities. I'm talking about your average run-of-the-mill, working-class, rich person. They're rich because they buy assets, okay? Whether they're income-producing or just appreciating assets, they buy assets. Poor people buy liabilities, Okay, because that's, you know, they can't they don't really have the money to buy assets, but different ways to think about that too. The middle class, which is where most of us fall, do something kind of peculiar. And it, in my opinion, it's what keeps most people middle class from really going to that next, next level and becoming wealthy. Uh, middle class people acquire liabilities that they think are assets. What am I talking about? I'm talking about like new cars, uh, shiny trinkets, uh, stuff like that. They have a little more disposable income than the than the lower income people. 
and justify spending money on some of these things because they think they're assets. Well, they're not. They're liabilities disguised as assets. And this is a very controversial one, but your home, a lot of a uh, wealthy people, or not wealthy people, but financial advisors say, your home is your biggest asset. Well, I say your home is a liability. It is not an asset. It does not provide you an income every month, unless it's like a duplex or a rental property and you live in half and rent out the other half. Uh, does it go up in value over time? Yeah, typically. But you also have you know, mortgage interest that cuts into that a lot of times, unless your house is paid for. You have property taxes that offsets a good part of that. And, I mean, it's your home. Do you ever want to lose it? Would you really want to be uh, constantly borrowing money against it? It can be an asset, but for most people, their home is their biggest liability. And when you sit down and do an honest assessment of things and figure out, okay, asset or liability, I kind of feel like you got to put a home in the liability category. A lot of people disagree with me. And that's fine. It's debatable either way. Um, so just remember that. Rich people acquire assets. The middle class acquire liabilities that they think are assets. But they're really liabilities. It could uh, change your approach to things, perhaps. It changed mine. When I really sat down and think, thought about it on a, a really deep level, it changed the way I do things a little bit. So let's continue on here. Now you'll hear the, hear the term balance sheet thrown around sometimes. A uh, balance sheet is a, a summary of a financial standing of a company, de detailing like assets, um, liabilities, equity. A balance sheet is just a summary of their business. Okay, when you hear people like on financial TV, oh, the balance sheet says this and that. All that is is like a, a summary. And you could carry a balance sheet on your business, and you should. I do one. I carry uh, carry one on monthly. Put all my numbers in. It gives me yearly totals. It's a really good way to have a handle on your on your business. Uh, book value. When you hear them say about book value, book value is the value of a company's assets after you subtract out liabilities. So it's what a company is worth, everything they have, minus everything they owe. Uh, and the book value is one of those things that gets reported on a balance sheet. A capital gain. Capital gain is... Um, the profit that results from selling assets that have gone up in value. That's really all a capital gain is. Now, capital gains are special because they get preferential tax treatment based on the amount of time that you own them. So to earn money through capital gains is a better way of earning money than through income. I did a video about that. Uh, go back and watch that. I can't remember. I think it's uh, the trucker money video. It's called Not All Income is the Same. That's a that's a really good video. Uh, a lot of value in that. Okay, let's talk about cost basis. Cost basis is simply just what you paid for an asset. So if I bought 100 shares of, I don't know, uh, Verizon at $60 a share, uh, going forward, my cost basis will always be $60. So if it goes up to 70 uh, and I sell it, my cost basis was 60. My, you know, take 70 minus 60 which is my cost basis, I made $10 a share. Now over time, you might buy some at 60, you might buy some at 62, you might buy some at 65. So you gotta take the total number of shares and the, and the price you pay and do some math and you can come up with what's called your average cost basis. Uh, that's what cost basis means. What do we got next here? Uh, debt to income ratio is something I look at when I'm, I'm looking at uh, an investment. And, or, like when you're trying to borrow money from a bank, they'll look at your debt to income ratio for your business, okay? And that's just uh, your monthly liabilities divided by uh, the amount you earn every month. And then it'll give you a ratio. So it'll say like your your payments or your liabilities are 80% of your income. That's pretty high, okay? It means you're only running out of 20% margin there. Uh, for your personal life, that would suck. For a business, it's not depending on the kind of business. Some it could be good, some it could be bad. Uh, it all depends. Depreciation. This is one that, that uh, you can certainly apply to your business. Uh, people do it. They say all the time, well, I'm buying a new truck so I can depreciate it out. Uh, take depreciation on my tax de return. Uh, what does that mean? It's just uh, depreciation is how you measure the decline in value of an asset over time. Uh, so if you buy a new truck, semi-truck, for $150,000, uh, 
it doesn't go up over time, it goes down. So uh, in real life, like you could say, you know, that truck will last, I'm throwing it out there, 10 years, okay? So you'd say 150,000 divided by 10, it depreciates $15,000 a year. But for tax purposes, they treat trucks, uh, you can fully depreciate them out in three years, sometimes just like three years and change, uh, or you can, there's a section 179 deduction, you can depreciate them all in one year depending on what your needs are. But that's all depreciation means. It's the decline in value of an asset over time. And that applies to like equipment. Uh, real estate actually definitely takes depreciation. Um, certain other expenditures, depending on the type of business. Then there's equity. Equity is how much you own of an asset after you subtract out what you owe on it. So your home, for instance, say you have a home that's worth $100,000 and you owe $70,000 on it. Well, your equity is $30,000, which means 30%, right? To keep the math simple. Banks will look at this when you go to borrow money. They'll, well, they'll combine this with, you know, your equity and your debt to income ratio. Uh, maybe you have equity in a business, you have equity in this, equity in that. Well, that all kinds of kind of adds up. Uh, equity is value, okay? can sometimes be used as collateral. Um, equity in some things they will not care about. Like banks won't take your 401k as collateral. Okay. There's just certain certain things that you can have all kinds of equity in, equity in and they won't care. Okay. Expense ratio. You probably hear this talked about all the time. Expense ratio is just a fee charged to shareholders for owning a particular investment. So if an investment is worth... Uh, thousand dollars or say a hundred dollars and you got to pay a one dollar fee once a year to have somebody manage that for you or whatever that's a one percent expense ratio okay pretty simple now expense ratios are important to understand because they can really eat up your profits over time uh, I did a video on that about the truth about your 401k you'll see just how important expense ratios are and why you should care um, and um, Measure them out, do the math, and they can they can really be substantial. Really change your your whole results for uh, investing in money. PE ratio. You probably hear this one a lot, especially on TV or whatever. They say, "Oh, the PE for this is that." And, uh, <clears throat> a PE ratio can be a way to measure uh, if an asset, if an investment is overpriced, if it's fairly priced, or undervalued. So, PE ratio is just the stock price versus earnings per share. So if you have a stock that is, um, we'll say $10, okay? And they're earning $1 per share over the year, okay? So the stock price is priced at 10, they earn a dollar. That would be a PE ratio of 10 because it's 10 times uh, earnings. Earnings is one, the price is 10. One times 10 is 10. So say the... Uh, share price is $50 and they make $2 a share. Okay. That's a uh, earnings or that's a, a PE ratio of 25. Do the math on that. Sorry. I'm doing math in my head. I got to get a better calculator in my head. Uh, divided by two equals 25. Yeah, that would be a PE ratio of 25. Uh, so the higher the PE ratio is possibly the investment is uh, not as attractive. It could be overpriced. Uh, generally, I see a PE ratio of 15 as right around fair value. So anything under 15. This is just, a, you know, this is not a, a set in stone. This is just a, a bit of a guideline that I use. Uh, uh, who did I get that from? Uh, Chuck Carnival over at Fast Graphs. If you, uh, that's a good channel to subscribe to on YouTube, Fast Graphs, if you want some help learning this stuff. Uh, 15 of a PE ratio is generally accepted as approximate fair value. Different businesses can be different, though, like REITs. You got to kind of throw a lot of these things out the window with REITs. And they do the math different. But So if it's under 15, I'm like, maybe I want to be a buyer right now. If it's way over 15, maybe it's overvalued, but maybe it's still going higher yet. You got to really look at the business, but... Uh, that's all that PE ratio means, the price in relation to the earnings per share. Let's talk about yield. Yield is just earnings on an investment that pay, uh, paid to shareholders 
expressed as a certain value like a percentage. So if you have a stock that is, say, $50, and they're going to pay you uh, $3.50 a year in a dividend. Okay, so we want to know what, what kind of percentage is that as a yield. So we would take, I'm just going to use my calculator, the one in the head is a uh, malfunction sometimes, $50 divided by 3.5, which is $3.50. Whoops, I'm sorry, I did that backwards. You want to take $3.50 divided by 50 equals 0 0.07, and then you got to times it by 100 to get your percentage. And that's a 7% yield. Okay, that's all that yield means. You got to figure out what the price is, $50, and what the dividend is, $3.50. So <clears throat> for, some, for some other math, say that, you know, we got a lower yield uh, let's say the share price is twenty dollars, okay, and we're getting a dollar and a quarter per year of a dividend. So one point two five divided by twenty times one hundred. That's a six point two five percent. Okay, so just being able to calculate. Uh, Kind of that way too, you can calculate returns. You know, uh, if you buy a $100,000 rental property and the rent off it is $6,000 a year, well, that's a 6% return, isn't it? Uh, it helps to be able to calculate, to, to know how to do the math to calculate returns. That could also be considered a yield, uh, whatever. So anyway, I just wanted to go through a couple terms here. And when you're researching different things to buy, researching investments, I, I, in general, I just want people to understand better how their money works. There is hundreds of terms like this we could get into, and maybe over the course of time, we'll throw a few out there here and there. But understanding and knowledge leads to more money, uh, being more powerful with your money, and uh, future success. So if you like these kinds of videos, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe. Again, check out the links in the description below. Uh, and uh, we will see you next time.